Okay, so I'm standing here with Garrett Oliver, Brewmaster in Chief at Brooklyn Brewery. I don't think he needs any more introduction because everyone should, or at least everyone that reads my blog or reads what I'm writing, to know who he is. It's a great pleasure to have you here in Stockholm, in Sweden, and just to be able to talk to you. It's a great pleasure to be here. We've been having a very good time. I heard that you were done at Falkenberg to do a special batch of uh, the Carnegie Porter. Yeah, we actually brewed it about a month ago, and uh, the uh, Wednesday we were barreling it, so we, uh, I sent over an entire container of bourbon barrels, 140 barrels, uh, of about 200 liters of beef, and uh, we filled them all with uh, the 175th anniversary edition of Carnegie Porter. And uh, it will be out approximately around November, but how long will it be in the, uh, the barrels? It will be in the barrels for two months, and I think it will actually be out slightly earlier. I think, what well, I understand is maybe it will be out September, October. Hey, uh, talk, uh, uh, and then again, I think tell us that eventually they're going to be at the Whiskey Festival. Okay. They will probably be able to uh, be bought at Sustainable Blog at okay. November. Oh, November, okay. So, eventually, we will find them out there. And, the perfect holiday gift. <laughs> <laughs> and perfect holiday drink. You want to go to Porter at Christmas. Yeah. yeah. So, and uh, with the barrel aging, it's going to be really nice with, uh, with the Christmas food. <laughs> uh, I know that quite many say that Brooklyn is somewhere in between American and European beer. And that it's hard to place Brooklyn brewery at the Is it more American or is it more European or British? And, I know from your history that you, know, you went to New York in uh, England, then how much influence are you from that experience? Is it, do you balance the beer to be some sort of between or? Well, I think uh, I, I like the idea that, uh, that we're very difficult to put in a, in a box. You know, because I think that, uh, yes, we are, we, we have a lot of European influence, but we have uh, distinctively our own style. Um, so we take a sort of European structure, if you like, uh, the beer, the balance of the beers, you know, certainly has a European influence. But the flavors themselves might be quite different. And so depending on which beers you're talking about, uh, some might seem quite European in style, where they might even be recognizable in some ways to people in Belgium or people in England. Some of them might be inspired by things that are no longer in England, uh, but once were. Uh, sort of uh, brewed out of an old inspiration and bringing it back uh, to be new today. Uh, so it really depends on which uh, which beer you're looking at. I mean, beers like uh, like Black Ops, the Imperial Stout style is itself quite old. But of course, they never aged in a bourbon bourbon barrel. So you know, this is the American part. Uh, but then refermentation in a bottle. Yes, it was done in England, but it was also done in Belgium and, uh, and Germany, uh, pretty widely. Uh, this beer, uh, Sriracha Ace, which will be in a system in Malaga soon, uh, brewed uh, in, in a Belgian style, but using a Japanese hop, which is now only grown in the United States. So, you have uh, uh, this big blend. Uh, Summer Ale is based on an old British style called Light Dinner Ale. And Light Dinner Ale was uh, you know, a very popular style in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, it was a lighter pale ale that was meant to uh, so a gentleman could have a, a lighter beer when around the head. Exactly. Um, and of course, uh, the old barley wine style, which uh, has almost died out in England, really, but has become quite popular in the United States. So you have uh, all these things sort of blended together, which are part of our personality. And especially if you put it in contrast to how most people perceive American beers today, is that they are extreme, they are overwhelmingly hoppy, and you might want to just be more and more of anything. Yeah. I would say that most Brooklyn beers are very balanced. I think that's true, and I think, but it's funny because uh, when I first started brewing, the uh, view of American beer, wherever you went, was that American beer tasted like water. You know, so you, you would say to somebody, oh, I'm an American brewmaster, they'd be like, oh, American. Yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, yeah, you brew uh, light lager. And uh, so, but now we are known for, uh, for being very creative. But almost in the other direction, we're known for our you know, over hopped beers or beers that are extreme or particularly strong. Now, we make a lot of strong beers and we have for a very long time. Black Chocolate Stout came out in 1994 at 10%. So we were way ahead of everybody else, but still very balanced. 
I have poured black chocolates now for 80 year old ladies with uh, blue hair, you know, and, uh, and uh, they drink it and say, oh, this would be really nice with chocolate cake. And it's not uh, something which is uh, uh, overwhelming, but it's very big. And both in the U.S., especially in Spain, lately, they have published this report saying that the interest for beer and craft beer is a little bit bigger than it is today. In the U.S., we see that uh, 200 years ago, and 100 years ago, or even 60 years ago, tons of breweries, most of them had to uh, quit their production, but it's coming back now. Oh, yes. And especially in Sweden, too, when you see more and more breweries started every day. And how do you uh, think that this brewing revolution will continue, and if uh, there's something that we can do to make life and for people to actually see that there isn't that much difference between drinking a good beer and good wine to food. Well, I think that uh, you know, what we're coming out of in both the United States and in Sweden is a strange period where beer, like other foods, became industrialized. And I think people, once they start drinking these beers, they never go back uh, to drinking uh, beer that tastes like water. However, I think that you will see a, a rise you know, in the number of breweries in Sweden, and then at some point you will see a decline. Uh, it happens in every country. You open up a bunch of businesses, and some businesses succeed and some businesses fail. And so people should not be surprised or worried when they see that maybe in a few years some breweries close. It's natural. You know, some, you know, there are 10 or 15, 20 reasons why you know, breweries close, even if the beer is good. Uh, but I think that uh, you know, uh, Sweden's uh, beer revolution is maybe a little bit more sustainable, partially because of the influence of Systembolaget, and because Systembolaget almost slows things down. It, 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 puts a, uh, uh, it puts on the brakes, and so things build maybe in a little bit more, uh, uh, yeah, better development, you know, and the breweries have to get stronger before they even attempt to go into that system. So maybe uh, maybe Sweden will have a slightly different arc than some other uh, countries. But uh, I think that you will see, even if you do see it go down a little bit, then you see it go back up even more strongly. And at the same time, I uh, see here that more and more people of these industrialized uh, breweries, like our first stuff, Hanaus and Bush, but uh, more and more uh, beers that they sell out as craft beers. Yes. And, is it the same in the U.S.? And is that a good sort of pathway here to oh, feel wrong? Yeah. Yeah. I don't feel yeah. enough in it, but you know, think you do, then you're actually dared to yeah. try something else and learn something else, or is it just what will it damage that room? Well, I think it, it, it can do both things. It really depends on, on what happens. I mean, certainly the big brewers use these beers to fill the shelf. So if there's spaces for all of their cake uh, craft beers, then they figure hopefully there'll be no room for real craft beer. But people, they see through it a lot of the time. Sometimes they don't. They have the it looks like Blue Moon, for example. Most people think that Blue Moon is either a little, a little brewery or in the United States or a brewery, a little small brewery in Belgium. Most people, they don't know that it's poor. But if, if you go teaching people who used to drink uh, Bud Light that uh, it's okay for beer to have fruity flavors and to be cloudy, uh, then you just, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you're like, come to Kagyo Kagyo. It's like, come on, come on to Daddy. We have uh, we have lots of beers for you. So I, uh, many brewers are quite angry about the beers made by the big brewers, but I don't worry about them. I think that. Uh, you know, they are the gateway uh, beer to a, a better thing. And the thing is that uh, you can always tell, you know, if you're if, if you're playing the game uh, on on your territory for the goal, you know, it's different. Nobody nobody in craft brewing is interested in making their beer, but they are interested in making our beer. So what this tells you is who's winning. Uh, and uh, you know, in the next 20 years, I don't think you're going to see any craft breweries looking to make something that tastes like Bud Light. But you're going to see all the big breweries trying to make stuff that tastes like our beer. So it's fine because I bring, you know, I say, bring the challenge. You know, let's see, let's see what you can do. Quite slowly, yeah, you see that many of the breweries are coming to the world with six different kinds of coffee. We are can taste this.
will they actually start making a beer with hops, and is it possible to produce such a humongous quantities of beer with good hop flavor, with good quality? I think, I think it actually is, yes. I think that uh, the, uh, the big brewers are technically very proficient. You know, the difficulties that they've had in reproducing the types of beers that we make are not uh, are not difficulties of, uh, of knowledge so much as difficulties of, 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 of perception. If you go to a brewery like Anheuser Busch and you say we're going to have a new uh, 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 we have a new beer and it's going to sell three million hectoliters, three million hectoliters would be bigger than any craft brewery in the United States, even bigger than Samuel Adams, which is huge compared to us. Um, and the animal would be nothing. It would be a failure. So their outlook is to try to uh, to sell to a mass market. Also, uh, could you know, they purchase, might, could they purchase all the Goose Island? Is it just for the economical side of it, or is it the fear too? I think it's, I, I think it's also cultural. I think they need they, they they they're not stupid. They can look at the writing on the wall. They know that uh, their business keeps going down and down and down. Uh, well, that type of beer keeps going down. I mean, the big brewers take a little chunks off of each other every year. But our business is going up and theirs goes down. It's not going to change. So they have to look forward to, okay, how do we avoid dying? Well, how we avoid dying is that we make that beer. Uh, and they're going to work harder and harder to do. You know, now you have uh, the guys at Real Accords, they have this thing called Kenton and Blake where they've, uh, they've taken this brewery, they've brought in all these outside people, and they have these teams of like 80 people or something who are working on these games. Half the beers, you know, compete with our beers. And uh, go back to Sweden, and June, June 1st, this Russia Ace will be available at Stimlog. And around the beginning of May or in next week we'll come to Sweden and be possible to find a bars and restaurants. It's being launched in Sweden at the same time as it's being launched in the United States. So, And this is a, uh, a new or regular version of the beer that you have done before. Yeah, we did it uh, first as a special draft beer. It was only around for several weeks. Uh, and then we brought it back to 2,500 cases only as a special. This is last year, last spring, and then we decided, okay, we, we, we want to make it permanently, and so uh, we decided to make it as a new permanent beer. Uh, we have not made a new permanent beer for years, so it's a big deal to bring out something that we say it's going to be on the shelves all the time. And it's a great beer. I bought it last year in New York. I uh, had it with, um, brought it to a barbecue and had it with some meat and it was delicious. How do you think that you should pair it with uh, food? Well, I, 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 I think it works with a wide variety of things. I usually pair it with seafood, especially salmon. Uh, but uh, here at, uh, 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 at this restaurant, we're pairing it with, uh, uh, with a soft shell crab, uh, garlic fried soft shell crab. You know, I know it's going to be awesome. It's great with mussels. Uh, so, but not just seafood, I think. Uh, also, uh, I like a lot of Thai, Thai cuisine. And so, cuisine of Thailand tends to be spicy and has a lot of uh, you know, lime juice. Which has a citrus character that uh, ties in very, uh, very nicely here. Uh, so there's a lot of different things. I mean, I'm not saying that it won't go with the steak. I think it's a separate quality that works fine with the steak. But I think more seafood and spicy flavor levels. And finally, I promised uh, my readers that I would have a lottery, and we would also be to sign up our lottery there. Put in the lottery. Oh, the yeah, absolutely, my pen is ready. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I was looking all day to find one, but it's in the. I was happy to talk to you, and we would be glad to be able to uh, find a beer soon back in Sweden. And this, I'll uh, uh, write more about this on the blog and on Facebook soon, and cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.